Hey friends, thanks for joining. Welcome to Breville's Masterclass for how to dial in the Barista Touch. I'm Matt Davis, product expert for Coffee with Breville. If you're tuning in for the live chat, feel free to ask questions throughout the class. We have a team of experts from Breville that are ready to answer your questions. However, if you're watching the on-demand version, feel free to email your questions to brevillebarista at brevillusa.com. I'm so excited to be here. Let's make some coffee. Now, here we have the Barista Touch. This was the first time we introduced a lot of automation into the Barista series. Really, really exciting. So in this class, we're going to make sure that you feel really comfortable, really confident approaching this machine, how to obviously use it, but more importantly, how to fix your coffee to get it to where it tastes really great. So before we get started, let's add some coffee. Now, when it comes to coffee, there's lots of different ways to approach it. Your preference matters, subjectivity is king. However, there are some objective differences when it comes to freshness. Now, if you've ever heard someone talk about freshness in coffee, it's a little tricky because it's technically a non-perishable item. So I'm using a vacuum canister here, and that's a really big part of it is maintaining the CO2 in coffee. And really, that's all we're talking about. So when I push down on that vacuum canister, what I'm doing is I'm removing the oxygen. Now, when we roast coffee, you immediately go through a really volatile state of dissipation of CO2. It's immediately starting to just a, like, just disappear into the atmosphere, right? So as soon as that starts happening, your coffee is losing all of its character. Now, it's not necessarily going bad, it's not changing. What's really happening is you're just losing the ability for you to access what the coffee has to offer. So if you really want great coffee and you found a coffee that you really love, just imagine that when it's at its peak freshness, that's when you have the most it has to offer. After about 30 days, again, nothing really changes other than you lose access to what it has. So I'm using whole bean coffee because we have a built-in grinder, but I'm also using coffee that had a roast date, right? So when you look at a bag of coffee, you might see a couple different iterations of dates. So there's a roast date, a best buy date, maybe even an expiration date or a date of manufacturing, okay? a roast date is going to be your best friend. It's going to be the most transparent way to know when the coffee was roasted and its shelf life, right? Again, going back to this 30 day rule. Now, after 30 days, it's still going to be good. You're just losing access. Okay. So if you if you have a bag of coffee that has a best buy date or an expiration date, we don't really know what that's rated for. So we don't know when it was roasted. So it's not the end of the world but maybe try to find a coffee that has a roast date. Because when it comes to espresso as a brew method, it's really important to have as much CO2 as possible. Just gonna help us really have a, a better experience because there's a lot of intense things happening when we make espresso and freshness will just help. Okay, so let's dive into some more ins and outs of this machine. Now, when we unbox it, we have a lot of different accessories that are really important to understand before we get started. And the main ones I wanna go over are these baskets. You're probably wondering, well, how am I supposed to know which basket to use? Everything else is really related to cleaning, and we have a ton of videos on how to use those. So today, let's really focus on workflow of making coffee, and that actually has a lot to do with choosing our baskets. Other than those, I have a couple of different accessories laid out that'll be really helpful for me as the home barista to really ensure that I have a really consistent, steady, comfortable workflow. Uh, some bar towels, rags, anything that you have to keep your space really clean and tidy is gonna be super helpful. I always keep one dry rag that I use for wiping out my port filter. You don't have to wear an apron every time you make coffee, so even if you just have an extra rag, on your counter that you use, maybe even as a tamping surface, really helpful. And then I have one more rag that I'll keep slightly damp that I use for wiping off my steam wand, okay? As soon as we're done steaming milk, we wanna make sure we clean our steam wand. So having that ready to go before we get started will save us some energy, okay? 
Over here, I have a knock box. You can use your trash can or waste basket as well, but a knock box is again, just a really helpful way to ensure that every time I go to make coffee, I have a really set routine that just makes it really easy. So I have to think less. Uh, I love that idea. <laughs> uh, we also have our dosing funnel. This comes with the machine. One of my favorite accessories really helps keep things really tidy and again, encourage consistency. Uh, and I'll show you how to use that. Another one, this is optional, but a scale. Uh, if you have one, fantastic. I'll show you how to use it. If you don't, no worries. We can still get really great results without it. Okay, so back to the baskets. Now, your machine comes with the single wall basket installed. So if you grab another basket, any of them, you can actually use the back of the lip to pop out the other basket just by holding it against, maybe go around a little bit, pop it out real nice and easy. I'll wipe this off a little bit and then let's understand from a visual perspective the differences and then understand more practically what those differences mean. So there's two types of filters and then two sizes of filters. So first off, the sizes, really simple. One's deeper, one's more shallow. So more coffee, less coffee, two cup, one cup, double, single, however you want to refer to it. We're always going to stick with the double cup because when it comes to a recipe, meaning how much coffee to how much water, uh, a double basket gives us a really good balance of coffee to water. You can still achieve it with a single, uh, but in the industry, meaning like the specialty coffee industry or going to a coffee shop, we're always going to be using a double basket. So for that purpose, we'll stick to that. Now, when we go to the double basket, we still have two different types. So. Visually, they're really close. If we look down from the top, they both have just a ton of different holes in them. It's not until we flip them over that we really see the difference. Now, you'll see one has the exact same holes inside and out. You could hold it up to a light and see straight through it. However, on the other one, you'll notice that the holes on the inside do not stay the same on the bottom. We actually have this additional layer with only one hole that the water actually passes through. So what that's doing is it's engineering back pressure. When we're making espresso, really our whole job as a home barista is trying to ensure that the water is passing through the coffee evenly and at an appropriate amount of time. If it passes through too quickly or too slowly, we're changing the amount of soluble material that's being extracted from the coffee, which means over or under extracted. Now, we're not gonna go down all the rabbit holes of what that means, just know that we are trying to find a sweet spot of contact time, right? So if the water passes through too quickly, we're not getting all of that goodness from the coffee, and if it passes through too slowly, we might actually be getting too much. So by changing the grind size, you know, picture two funnels, one has sand, one has rocks, and if you pour water through both of them, the same thing is going to happen just at two different rates, right? Two different times. So we want to encourage the water to pass through at a certain amount of time by making the sizes of coffee smaller or bigger. So if you're using whole bean fresh coffee, you can use the single wall basket, the one that has the same holes top and bottom. However, if you're using pre-ground coffee or maybe even coffee that doesn't have a roast date or maybe it does and it's just a little bit old, because of that loss of CO2, we're gonna have a similar response where the CO2 can no longer aid in holding that water back. So the water might still pass through too quickly. So by using this dual wall basket or this pressurized basket, only having one hole on the backside actually engineers that back pressure to help hold back that water so it doesn't come flushing through too quickly. So let's say you have your favorite whole bean caffeinated coffee ready to go, and then in the evening, you just spontaneously want a decaf cappuccino, right? Well, instead of having to take out all your coffee, you could just use a pre-ground decaf. Now, you would want to switch your basket to accommodate not being able to control your grind size because your machine is dialed in for a specific grind size and chances are if you bought pre-ground coffee it might not match so by using this basket it just helps you be able to have some flexibility at home 
So hopefully that makes sense. And for today, we're going to be using the single wall basket. We're using fresh coffee, roasted within 30 days, ready to go. So I'm just gonna drop these back into our handy dandy accessories bin so they're easily accessible whenever we need them. All right, so we're pretty much ready to go. So let's focus on the machine now. Let's actually start making some coffee. We have our portafilter and basket ready. We have our dosing funnel ready. Last thing is to, well, I guess first thing <laughs> is to turn on the machine. This machine has what's called a thermojet heating system, which means when I turn it on, it's only going to take three seconds for the machine to actually get to temperature. It's almost instantly ready. So as soon as we turn it on, uh, we now have access to hot water. It's important to know though, on the barista touch, we can't do anything until we select the beverage that we want to make. So we could go anywhere from just a regular espresso up to a flat white cappuccino, whatever. So let's just do a latte. Once we select latte or any drink for that matter, we'll have a set screen of different sets of process. So first you have grind, then brew, then milk. Now you could technically do milk first. However, I always recommend starting with coffee and then finishing with milk. So really left to right is a great workflow. So you're gonna grab your portafilter, you're gonna grab your dosing funnel and you're simply going to lock it into place, okay? Now the purpose of this dosing funnel is just that, it's to help with dosing. Now, when I say dosing, I really just mean putting the coffee into the basket of the portafilter. Now, if I didn't have the dosing funnel, you could totally do it just like this, right? However, what happens is in order to get a really great recipe or dose, which is around 18 to 22 grams of coffee, uh, you might start to have a little bit of an overflow. So the dosing funnel helps to keep everything nice and tidy together and will also help with distribution. We'll talk about that in a second as well. So we're just going to put the dosing funnel into our cradle of the grinder. Now, before we start grinding, let's look at two things. We have the number at the very bottom with the gear. That's our grind size. You're gonna have that on the left side of the machine, right? So you can go to the left to make it finer, to the right to make it coarser. We're currently set at setting 15. Uh, we have a total of 30 grind settings, so 15 is right in the middle, so we'll start with that. The number above that, and you'll see it next to a picture of baskets. So this is uh, to change your setting from either a single or double basket. So make sure we have it set to the double basket. We're currently set at 12 seconds, and I'm actually going to be doing this in two grind cycles. You don't have to do it that way. Um, I just have it set that way so that I can actually distribute in the middle of the grind cycle. I'll show you what I mean by that. Now, I'm going to use the scale so that if you do happen to have one, you can understand how to use it when you're dialing in. So with the dosing funnel in place, we're going to put the portafilter on the scale and we're going to turn it on. Now, if the scale was already turned on, I would then need to press the TZ button to either tear it or zero it out because we don't want to know how much the portafilter weighs. We only want to know how much the coffee weighs. So once it's set to zero, we can then go and start grinding. A simple push to the back will begin the grinding process. Right. And so what I'm going to do is give this a little bit of a settle halfway through just by tapping it against my wrist. Settle, settle, settle. You can kind of see I no longer have a mound. The coffee has settled and it is creating a nice even density across the basket of the portafilter. So now I can go back to the grinder and do that again. Right, now let's see what we have. We'll put it on the scale. All right, so we're a little light here. We're at 16, so we're going to just manually add a little bit more coffee. And to do so, we're going to push and hold to turn it into manual mode. And as soon as we release, it'll stop grinding. 
So just adding a little bit more. All right, perfect. So that's right what we want. We want anywhere between 18 to 22 grams of coffee. This machine really loves the 18 to 19 range. Now you can see we have a little bit of a mound on top of the basket right here of coffee. And we want to do what's called distribution. We've already done a little bit of it uh, by settling the grounds midway through. So we're just gonna do that again and again. And this is really helpful because we have the dosing funnel. So we're not gonna make a mess by doing so. Just tapping it against our wrist. We could also just settle it against the counter. Either one works. But what we're trying to do is eliminate any space or air pockets underneath the coffee. So we're forcing it to settle, take up as much space as possible because that's going to ensure that we have even density all throughout this basket. And that's going to be really critical when we tamp our coffee. So we can now remove our dosing funnel, put our scale and everything to the side. Once I have that set and I can adjust my timer, I don't need to use the scale every time. I really only use it once for the actual dialing in process. Once I have my coffee tasting great, I can just do it with my eyes closed. So I have my coffee nice and settled. I'm ready to tamp. Now, I like to set it either on a tamp mat or a washcloth or something to just protect the portafilter as well as my countertop. So I'm going to grab my tamp, which is magnetically hidden in the machine. Now, this is really important, the way that we hold our tamp, okay? We don't wanna hold it like this. We don't want to hold it like this. We want to grab it like a doorknob or a flashlight. That way we can use our index and thumb as reference points to feel the edge of the basket while we're tamping to ensure that we're not pushing to one side. And that's obviously an extreme example, but even just a slight push will change that density and it will encourage the water to find a path of least resistance and then you're under extracting part of your coffee and you're just not getting all what you paid for and what you worked for. So taking your time, again, work slowly, work intentionally, and everything that you do, try to build consistency so that you can repeat it over and over again uh, without having to think too much. So holding it like a doorknob or a flashlight, we're going to use our entire forearm to be perfectly perpendicular into the puck of coffee but before we apply pressure, I'm just setting it on there, and I'm going to use my index and thumb to give it a little twist, and that way I can really ensure that I'm level. Once we're there, we can then, I'm just going to use my body weight. I'm coming up on my tiptoes, and I'm just leaning onto the coffee. Now, you'll feel the coffee kind of settle a little bit, and then it'll stop. And that's the coffee telling you that it's done being tamped. Don't overthink how much pressure you tamp with. A lot of people get distracted by trying to find just the perfect weight, but it's really hard to over tamp coffee. So you really just want to make sure that again, that you're removing those air pockets. Okay. So by using your body weight, you can do it consistently, right? You're just leaning onto it. When it stops moving, you're done. If I'm pushing, it's going to be hard to repeat that over and over again. And it's a lot easier and less strenuous on you. So that's tamping. We're level, we're repeating the amount of pressure by using our own body weight as a leverage. Now we're ready to brew. So at this point, you should have a perfectly prepared puck. So you can kind of analyze it a little bit if you want to, to see if it looks even or level. Don't worry about little bits and pieces of coffee up against the side. Those are all gonna come together when it gets wet. Uh, really what you want to make sure is you don't have any coffee along the rim. So you can just give it a quick brush with your hand. Good to go. Okay, so at this point, uh, we are ready to brew. So we need to select what drink we want to use, right? So again, let's go into latte. We're going to put our portafilter into the group head, which is just where the water comes. It comes out of like a shower screen. And we're just going to twist it until we're perpendicular with the machine. Now, I could technically keep going to the right here, uh, but you don't have to. Um, it'll actually help prolong the life of the gasket that's up inside that group head by not over tightening. So just know that once you're at 90 degrees, you're good to go. And at this point, you can switch from double to single to custom for your output. Now, 
This machine runs off of a timed system. So it's going to automatically stop at a certain amount of time. So for a single shot, it'll automatically stop at 25 seconds and for a double, 30 seconds. If you want your shot to pull for a little bit longer or shorter, then you can go to custom by pushing it an extra time and then just adjusting that time, okay? So for demonstration, let's just go to double and see what happens. So what we're using to gauge whether or not we like the shot, uh, aside from tasting it, of course, which we will do regardless, um, is how much volume comes out in that amount of time. We want about two ounces, okay? So let's see what happens. We're going to push brew, put our glass underneath, pay attention to both the timer and the actual shot coming out, okay? We wanna see drips at about 10 seconds. Okay, that was almost spot on. And at about 30 seconds when this automatically turns off, we want to have extracted a full 60 milliliters or roughly two ounces. Okay, so we're really close. I'm not sure if you can see this, but this glass does have marks for 30 and 60 milliliters. And again, 60 milliliters is really close to two ounces. So we wanted our shot to pull just a little bit longer to get to that point. So there's two things we could do. And again, this is dialing in. Once we get there, we're not gonna have to change a whole lot. We could extend the time by going into custom and say, okay, in 30 seconds, it didn't quite get there. So maybe I could go up to 34 seconds, 35 seconds. We always say a good range is between 22 to 37 seconds. That's kind of like what we wanna aim for. Anything outside of that is gonna be getting really close to either an under or over extracted shot. Now it's a pretty big window because every coffee is different. The coffee that I'm using all the numbers that I have are probably not gonna be the same for yours. So just know that depending on what coffee you're using, you might have to adjust accordingly. So let's try one more shot. Let's see what happens if I either change the time and then the other option would be to change your grind size. Now because the shot pulls for 30 seconds and I got really close, instead of changing the time, I actually wanna change the grind size. And again, you could go either direction. So, you know, feel free to play around with it a little bit. I'm using my rag to dry and clean my portafilter first. Again, I'm going to put on my dosing funnel. I'm not gonna use my scale again because I feel like I'm already kind of at the right dose based on the timer of the grinder. So instead, I'm going to come to the side here. I'm going to see that I'm currently at grind size 15. And I wanted a little bit more water to flow through. So I'm going to make it easier for the water to pass through so that I can get more in the same amount of time. So I'm going to go from grind size 15 up to grind size 16. Not a crazy change. I don't recommend making more than two to three grind size adjustments at a time. Otherwise, you're gonna end up kind of chasing your tail and overcompensating back and forth. So two to three adjustments at a time. And like for this one where we were so close, just one adjustment can go a long way. Okay, so I did that and I'm also going to adjust my grind timer up just one second because I ended up needing to manually add a little bit more last time. And I'm going to change my custom back to just the default double and let's see what we get. Give it a little settle, midway through, one more. All right, one last settle. The dose looks perfect. So I can remove the dosing funnel. I can do my tamp making sure I'm level, body weight coming down, 
And then you'll see, like once you've done this a few times, the workflow is really simple. Remember, we're trying to create as much repeatability as possible. All right, so now let's keep an eye again on the time and the flow rate. It drops at 10-ish, right? That's a range. Okay, pretty close. Looked a little bit earlier. We can already tell that the streams are a little bit heavier, a little bit thicker. That water is passing through more easily. Look at that, we're already at two ounces. So I'm actually going to cut it short at 27 seconds. So next time I'm going to change my time to stop at 26 seconds because we actually went over a little bit. So just by making that one grind size adjustment, I was able to allow that water to pass through more quickly to get a full two ounces of output. And I noticed that by keeping track of my time, that 30 seconds was going to be too long. Now, I always encourage you to taste your espresso regardless because it's really helpful for palate development and for learning your own subjective take on coffee flavor. All right, so that was that one. Pretty good. Definitely not a bad shot. Yeah, but that one's still just more balanced. So I would drink both of those, honestly, but I am really happy with that change that I made. So I'm going to keep that. Now, because I made a change, you'll notice an icon in the top here. It looks like a cup with a plus sign. What I can do is I can now push that button and save those settings and name it. I can call it Matt. I can call it cappuccino. I can name it whatever I want to. And then I can give it a picture so that next time all of those settings will be saved. Okay, so we have our uh, shot of espresso. We have dialed it in. Fantastic work. Hopefully that makes sense. But what happens now is to acknowledge that we now have the base of all espresso beverages imaginable. A double shot of espresso can be used for anything, whether it's a long black or Americano by just adding some hot water or a cappuccino, a macchiato, a latte. You can do an iced latte. You can do so many different things. So take your time to get this right and then have a ton of fun with being adventurous of trying a bunch of different drinks. So that being said, let's talk about milk. Okay, so I have some whole milk here. Now, I prefer using whole milk because it has a really good mix of fats and proteins that make for a very uh, delicious velvety micro foam, right? However, if you're lactose intolerant or you just prefer the flavor of oat milk, almond milk, soy milk, whatever, you could switch to that as well. Just know that if you're going back and forth between two, the technique of how you steam it might change a little bit. However, this machine does it all for us. Now, I'm going to pour my whole milk into a steaming pitcher that comes with your machine. I like to fill up my pitcher to where it's just below the bottom of the spout, right? So if we use this as a reference point, you can see it on the inside of the cup too, or the steaming pitcher. Um, but depending on how big of a cup you're using, you might change that a little bit. So just keep that in mind. Put the milk back. All right, so let's understand how this steaming system works and what we need to do. Uh, first off, it's extremely simple for us as the user. Uh, so let's go back into the drink that we were making. Uh, and again, we can change all of the settings on our coffee and we can also do so for our milk. So we can change the temperature of the milk and the froth or the foam level of the milk. Let's think about it as texture, right? We can have milk that's very thin in texture, or we can have milk that's very heavy in texture. So if you want more foam, you could go and push the button on the right and you can drag it all the way up to setting number eight. And then if you wanted almost no foam, you could vice versa, go down to one. Now, when you go into any of these drinks, you'll notice that there is a default recommendation of how to steam that milk. So for a latte, we recommend setting number five. Feel free to change it, and if you do so, don't forget to save those settings. I'm gonna keep it at five, and then for the temperature, it's currently at 150. I actually prefer mine to be a little bit cooler. 
So I'm going to go down to 140. You go in 10 degree increments. Play around, learn what suits your tastes and preferences the best, okay? Now we're going to pull up on our steam wand. We're going to take our steam pitcher and we're going to ensure that it's resting on top of this little sensor, which is the temperature sensor. So in the drip tray, you'll notice that the steaming pitcher needs to be resting on top. It doesn't have to be fully over it. As long as it's coming into contact with that sensor, you'll be good to go. Once it's there, it doesn't really matter exactly where you have it located. The system's going to do it all for you. So you just need to push the icon that says milk. And at this point, it says it's frothing. Once it reaches 105 degrees, it will start giving you a live readout of the temperature as it increases. So what's happening right now is we use what's called a Venturi valve to actually suck in air and then push it directly into the milk. So instead of us having to manually figure out how to do that, the machine does it all for us. So I could go make my breakfast, I could do whatever I want, come back, and then all I need to do is take my final vessel, put my shot of espresso into it, and don't worry about your espresso sitting for a little while. Yes, the crema might dissipate, but that's just a byproduct of CO2, so the flavor of the coffee will still be there. It might just cool down a little bit. So as long as you're okay with that, don't worry about your espresso sitting for just a little bit. That's why I prefer to do my coffee first and then my milk last, because the foam in your milk will actually die a lot faster. Now, we have our rag that we already had slightly damp, so that when we pull this out, we'll be able to immediately give that steam wand a wipe. And then don't forget to push it down because the machine's going to uh, rinse itself. So it's gonna give a purge of water through that system to make sure milk doesn't get stuck up inside there. Huge step for preventative maintenance and one less thing for you to worry about. Okay, so now let's construct our beverage, right? We have our milk. A little tap, a little swirl helps to mix the foam that we created back into the full body of milk. We have our espresso. So all we're going to do is tilt our cup a little bit, come at a little bit of a distance, fill up about halfway, and then we're going to get really close and then just slowly increase your pour speed. In doing so, you'll be able to pour a heart just because of the hydrodynamics of foam density as you increase the solution. So you're adding the foam texture to the espresso, and by the time it gets full, the foam in the milk will be able to just simply float on top of the milk. Now, what's really great about this beverage is the silky texture, and you don't see a ton of bubbles, but there's millions of microscopic bubbles all throughout this beverage, and that's what gives you the really amazing drinking experience to where you kind of feel foam all the way to the very last sip. And that's really what makes it. Okay, so that was dialing in on the Barista Touch from coffee to milk to putting them together. I'm honored to have been a part of that journey for you. I hope it was helpful and I encourage you to have fun with coffee and thank you so much for joining. We'll see you next time.